This is gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. Total concentration. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And I got two of my good friends here today. And I wanted to, you know, fill in the blanks on some of my key blind spots. And we decided we were gonna do a retrospective on Avengers Kree Scroll War. I believe it happens in Avengers 89 to 97 with Roy Thomas as the writer. It starts out with, I think, is it Sal Buscema as the artist? And we get Neil Adams, and then I think the other Buscema is finishes John, it up, yeah. right? Yeah, John Buscema finishes it up. The man who thought that this would be the one to talk about first is the comic book reporter himself. How you doing, Marie? I'm doing good. And obviously, we do have a professional writer. We have an award-winning editor, Joe Corrado. How you doing? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. So this was... I've read around the story, and I'm aware of it, of some of the events that happened in it, but I had never actually read it myself, so it was fun to get into this. The art is fantastic. It's, it's a lot of fun. Like, there's a moment where Nick Fury is flying a fighter jet. His co-pilot is Dum Dum Dugan. He's still wearing the bowler hat. I love stuff like that in comic books, mm -hmm. so that was fun to see. One of the cool things about some of these older stories, it's like a time capsule of American culture. Like at, at that moment, and to see that so how how many so many of the Marvel stories kind of revolve around like the space program. Cape Canaveral is the heart of like the big mystery or, or the big plot point. So I enjoy stuff like that. It's one of the real treats of kind of going back and reading some of these older stories, Joe. Yeah, no, I um, you know, I I really love uh, you know going back and diving in, putting things in perspective. So uh, for people who might not be familiar. With the Kree Scroll War, this was going on from the middle of 1971 through like March of 72. Uh, helmed by Roy Thomas, uh, with Stanley as the editor on on the book. This was a bit of a turbulent might be the wrong word, but this was this was not overall one of the higher points in, in terms of Marvel history in that. Jack Kirby had just recently left Marvel in the months prior to this to start the fourth world over at DC. Denny O'Neill was becoming big over at uh, DC. He had taken the reins on Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Superman, and Batman Detective Comics at this time. Uh, prior to the story launching, I want to say the month before, I think it's Detective 411, uh, was the creation of Talia al Ghul. The month this story came out was the creation of Raja Ghul, and that was with Neil Adams doing the interiors as well. The month after this, at DC, Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson created Swamp Thing in, I get House of Mystery 94? Two. 92. Yeah. And then I believe that month as well was the uh, reveal of Speedy being an addict. So DC was kind of firing on all cylinders at this point. And, you know, I don't know if that was reflected in the sales or not. Marvel could have still been dominating the, the sales at this point. However, um, Marvel had lost Jack. They'd lost Steve Ditko a while before this. He was working primarily at Charlotte and Comics at, at this point. Um, Stan's eras on spider-man and fantastic four were winding down um what was uh john ramita senior was this was i think during this story is when he took a hiatus from spider-man to take over uh captain america and the falcon for issue 138 so 145 i, I want to say was his run um, so you had Gil Kane on Spider-Man. And during this story, uh, Stan took a brief hiatus uh, for Roy Thomas to write Spider-Man for about four issues. So this was this all takes place during a really interesting time. Um, it's still a couple of years before, like uh, Jim Shooter is out of the picture. Uh, he had left DC uh, at this point. Uh, we have a couple of years... Uh, was it Don McGregor and like Steve Gerber are just getting involved in Marvel um, towards the end of this story, maybe a little after uh, we're still, this is still before George Perez 
Roger Stern, Steve Englehart. Uh, so, so this this is a bit of an interesting uh, time capsule for for that reason. So basically, Marvel's in transition as, as DC are kind of picking up steam as far as their creativity. Now, Eric, you weren't even reading comic books at this point, right? You started reading a few years after this story came out, right? right? So when you finally discovered this, did you feel like you, you'd found something special? Well, I credit the Kree Scroll War with being the first truly great comic book event. Now, that's not to discount the Galactus trilogy, which was actually two issues, <laughs> or the um, you know, the uh, drug issues of Spider-Man, or, or some of the stories that happened there, or some of the grand in scope story arcs that Stan and Jack did in Thor. This was kind of a, the template for what comics could be going forward. And it was a, it, basically the term like sprawling epic would apply to this storyline. Mm -hmm. Um and it, I said, took you know, nine issues to tell, you know, subplots, you know, plots within plots. They, you know, Stan or Roy got to really showcase his ability as a writer by, and, and he got to work in some of the things that I'm sure were important to him, like the, the, um, House of Un American Activities Committee were, you know, kind of, it became what Senator Craddock had created the you know, the alien commission, something alien commission. Um, he got to showcase his love of golden age characters by finding a way to bring them into the story, if only for a couple of panels. But it, this, I mean, it and one of the things that the store that the I best remembered was the first half of issue ninety three. Mm -hmm. which was the 10 year anniversary. And the first half of the book is devoted to um, Hank Pym shrinking down to ant size and going inside the vision's body to repair him. Yeah. And we, that's when we found out how big of an EC fan Roy Thomas was because he was dropping EC comics references throughout it. And it's just, anybody hasn't read that, if nothing else, so that's my good. favorite part of the story easily. It, it was it was mine too. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it, for years it was mine until I've gone back and dissected the story several mm -hmm. times since then. Sure. It's still a highlight because it's just I mean it's it, it's so beautifully rendered and mm -hmm. think about it, that this is 50 years old now. Yeah. I mean, you know, it it be, might be hard to impress a newer reader who has seen so many great artists come after, but to see art like this in a superhero comic in 1971 you, you know it, you had neil adams whatever what, you know he was the only one doing stuff like this and this was a tour de force for him oh yeah no artistically this is incredible uh this this section of the book but yeah as soon as it, it changes because I, I remember i opened it up and i'm looking at it, I'm like this looks different i'm like oh neil adams i'm like when did he take over I'm like, oh this is the issue he takes over and there's so many yeah. wonderful little weird things that's going on is as uh, Hank Pym's you know, uh, <laughs> basically traveling through his body and trying to repair him. It's, it's a lot of fun. So this is an interesting story. It's not, it doesn't start out with the Avengers that we would think of. It's not Captain America and Thor and, and Iron Man. It's it's Vision. I think, what do we got? Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch. It feels like Rick Jones is a part of the Avengers, but maybe he just kind of shows up to, to help out. We mm -hmm. got, what do we got? Wasp. At this point, uh, it would have been Yellow, ja Man? Yellow Jacket. Yellow Jack and, and, right. and Clint Barton as Goliath is Goliath. Yeah. So it's it's not your traditional team, and it's it's kind of starts out with a mystery. I gotta say this, Eric. I'm still like every time I read Rick Jones, depending on where I start, it feels like a new character. Why is that? Well, again, you know, in the early years of Marvel, Rick Jones was kind of the guy you used for i guess for lack of a better term for a plot device he started off as being the teenager in the jeep who had a bet with his friends that, that he could you know sneak onto the gamma ray testing site and he was the one that bruce banner saved at the last moment as the gamma rays hit him so he's inadvert he inadvertently created the hulk and he was he you know 
but he was his sidekick. Right, his guy kept him in check in the very early issues. Then when they when the Hulk went off and Rick Jones could no longer be in a position to fall him, he formed a, the Teen Brigade, you know, a group of random teenagers with their ham radios, and he was instrumental in bringing the the characters together who would eventually form the Avengers to investigate something that the Hulk was accused of doing was actually Loki behind the scenes. So then that led to a kind of a, you know, an idolization of Captain America and and Rick Jones was designed to look a lot like Bucky. So he ended up at various points being kind of cap sidekick. And then there was a story in Captain America in like the one teens where the super or I'm sorry, the red skull gets the cosmic cube and takes over Captain America's body. And Rick Jones doesn't know that comes up to, you know, Hey, how you doing? He doesn't know Rick Jones. So he just goes away from me, you know, whatever, and backhands him into oblivion. And Rick doesn't know that that's not the real cap. So he's kind of at loose ends. That's where he meets, you know, Captain Marvel. And the, through a plot, you know, he ends up in possession of the nega bands that, he, you know, when they clang together, they switch at, they switch places. And when one's on earth, the other one's in the negative zone. So he kind of had a rich early history at Marvel. <laughs> yeah. So that's a big part of this story, Joe. So he and mm-hmm. Captain Carpet Marvel are, are switching places. And we find out things are amiss on Earth, and that kind of sets off our adventure. And they end up, I believe, Captain Marvel gets captured. He's taken off to, I believe, it seemed like it was Antarctica, somewhere around Alaska. And they have mm-hmm. to go off on an adventure there. And that's when they run into, I think, Hank Pym and uh, Janet Van Dyne at, up there. Uh, I guess it would have been Yellow Jacket and a Wasp. There's a yeah. really great moment where they're going in there. Well, it's not a great moment, it's a weird moment. <laughs> Uh-huh. Where, where they're on the, the back of this thing and then like I think Hank Pym maybe for the first time hits his wife because he has to knock her out so he can go and try and save Marvel but and then he gets like devolved and that's like the what the plot is of Ronan the Accuser at the beginning is he yeah. they see the earth and the heroes on earth could be a, a problem for the the Kree empire so they're going to devolve the entire planet back into cavemen it was yeah the first one they do that to is Hank Pym it seems like a roundabout way to do things instead of just wiping off life on Earth. But, you know, who who am I to tell them where they should uh, devote their uh, research and development? But uh, something interesting about this, too, especially for people unfamiliar with the story, unfamiliar of this era of, of Marvel, this is still a time where the Fantastic Four is the flagship book. The Fantastic Four is where they mine everything from. A lot of the characters, we, the Kree, the Skrull, you know, Ronan the Accuser, uh, the Super Scroll, Annihilus, all Inhumans, all from the pages of Fantastic Four. Um, and, and Roy Thomas was a big fan. I think he had a letter published in the first, uh, I think it was the first issue where they had a letters uh, page column and I want to say Fantastic Four number four. Uh, he was really into that. And uh, you see his love of those early issues here when uh, he tells us what happened to those three scrolls that ended up on the farm after uh, the events of um, Fantastic Four number two. So that's one of the, the more funnier parts of the story because it turns out that the Fantastic Four, because I guess they mind controlled these these scrolls that they had into thinking that they were cows. Mm-hmm. They're basically just living oblivious on a farm, eating like cows. I guess they didn't want to kill them. And it yeah. turns out that ends up being a fatal mistake that, that uh, essentially brings worlds in, into collision and there's going to be a, a massive war. It turns out the Fantastic Four almost screw the entire universe. Almost a decade after that. Like, <laughs> keep, keep, keeping this in mind, like, that's that's a long setup payoff in, in comics at that time to to go back that far uh it, it, it was it was really cool yeah and as far so, as you know captain marvel's involvement at the time he was he wasn't involved in the the story in the antarctic he was dying of radiation from prolonged exposure to it while he was in the negative zone yeah that's how he gets brought into the story and the avengers have to basically capture him for his own good and word gets out that he's an alien thanks to the 
long forgotten fourth scroll who has taken mm. the guise of H. Warren Craddock, U.S. Senator, and that's that's how he's able to whip the populace into a uh, an, an, a, a frenzy to substituting the communists for aliens. And he's yeah. got a list of 103 or 153 model citizens who are actually aliens masquerading on Earth. So yeah. it's it's I said that and that that's the you know ties to the real world element of this story. Mm -hmm. This is so that, years years yeah. before Mystique would uh, impersonate uh, political figures for things like that. Yes, I really like the commission that they do on there. They bring in a bunch of character witnesses and. For the most part, they're, you know, all the, the scientists that were involved in the original incident that were supposed to be quiet that turned them in. They're like, what are we supposed to do? These guys are dangerous, you know. And then, you know, they talk to Reed Richards like, oh, you know, I trust the Avengers. If that's what they say happened, you know, we should trust them. And then they get up the, the thing up there. You know, he can't keep his mouth shut. He's like, I don't know what to do. These aren't even the, the original Avengers. I trust them. But these are the new Avengers. I don't even know these pups. You know, they, they're wanting to fight over it. Yeah. So the uh, the commission that's going on is fun. You see all kinds of of signs. I think there's even even a uh, Avengers, and it says disassemble on the bottom. I wonder where Brian Michael Bendis got that story idea from. <laughs> so there's some wonderful things in the background to look at there. Mm -hmm. And there was a cool way they got the you know, Goliath out of the mansion so they could yes you know, serve him with the summons to appear at that meet at yes. that hearing. The idea of a man serving Goliath summons for a court appearance. Is amazing and it's beautifully rendered and executed in this comic book. I wish he'd picked him up and tossed him, but of course he's a hero, so he couldn't do anything like that. Yeah. But no one wants to get served papers. No, and uh, this is also uh, where they're reinforcing this vision Scarlet Witch uh, romance that would end up, you know, obviously becoming a bigger thing later. But um, you know, the vision clearly having feelings for Scarlet Witch. Uh, we this is kind of the the end or the twilight of of the silver age at marvel where the characters are starting to become what i think we all think of them as quicksilver is starting to develop that like hot temper uh and, and being overly protective of his sister and 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 things like that in, in a way that it is setting everything up for what the rest of the 70s would, would kind of end up as but he doesn't appear to be running when he's in action he appears to be rolling <laughs> i, I, I think that? i think artists like that pose because yeah quicksilver the bowling ball appeared a lot always, in those his days. knees are tough yeah mm -hmm. and he's like kind of like is he just rolling everywhere i thought he was a fast runner yeah but you have that, but you also have uh, some some of you internet savvy folks may have seen that panel of, uh, you know, Cap and Iron Man and Iron Man has the rocket skates. You know, that's from the pages of the, the Kree Skrull War. So if you uh, if you love uh, looking up memes and, and knowing where they came from, this is one of those comics. So there's another piece of art in here. I'll, I'll talk about this before we get into the, the segue to the original Avengers, where it, Vision's like taking off, but he appears to have no head. Anyone mm. else ever notice that? No. He, he like he like starts flying out of his clothes. His clothes are like landing on the ground, and he's flying, but he's he's headless. It's so weird. I'm gonna show. I'll put a picture up right here when I put the video. Was his head already through the ceiling? That's what I was thinking. I think his head, he might have already, they were trying to, I think, show that he was phasing there's, through. Because, well, the next thing, there's like a little, there's a part where there's a head that's bouncing. And I was like, did it get chopped off by a helicopter or something? <laughs> but I was like, but that's Quicksilver's face because he's reacting to something happening. Yeah. And it's initially, I was like, oh my goodness, they cut his head off. But that's not what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I no, was, uh... It was pretty confusing there. So we do get the big reveal that apparently, you know, they, they've been publicly scorned. The commission does not go in their favor. The original Avengers show up. We've got Thor. We've got Captain America. We've got Tony Stark, Iron Man. And they mm -hmm. essentially disassemble the team and, and yeah. fire them. They said, you we, are no longer Avengers. We think the original Avengers showed up. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is what we, we think. And it's certainly <laughs> what the characters say. Felt like a big moment, Eric, for you. If, 
if you didn't know what was going to happen next, did it feel like a big moment? It seemed like it should have been. Well, yeah, when, when I when I first read it, um, I read 92. In those days, I didn't have a trade. Yeah. So I, I got, I think I had 92 before I had 93. And it was like, wow, look, you know, what's going on here? The original Avengers are kicking them out. And then, of course, the next issue, we find out what had truly happened, that the reason why the original Avengers were assembled again was Tony Stark had called a meeting based on a letter that Jarvis had given him. It was like, we, wait, wait, we did what? So they <laughs> reassembled the original Avengers. And that's how, you know, Hank Pym, who had, you know, made it very clear he was leaving the team, but he did, he did return for that. You know, which, you know, fortuitous timing is it allowed him to save the vision, which gave them the, you know, when the vision regained consciousness, you know, there's a line where he goes, you know, where where, um, Thor says, perhaps we've regained an Avenger today. And the vision says, well, I hope he can replace the four whom you so callously dismissed. Yes. And the other two are like, what the fuck's he talking about? What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) And then Tony said, well, that's why I called everybody here. And, you know, that, that's when, you know, the, the bells start going off. It's like, yes. You know, oh. oh, and then they explain the cows. And you're like, those were, those were scree- or, uh, scrolls that were impersonating yeah. them to cause division in the, amongst the ranks. Yeah. It's definitely a, a, a light bulb moment. Absolutely, Brain. So that, that was absolutely wonderfully executed. In this. And it's amazing how much stuff they cram into nine issues here. Like, yeah. And, and there's the other part right around the same time where, um, where, where you know, Captain Marvel is trying to reconstruct the Omni Wave, and you know Carol Danvers keeps calling him Marvel, and when he he just you know when, when he when the light bulb goes off in his head, he goes crushes it, and says you're not her, he goes you know, only the scroll know my real name, yeah, yeah other than yeah crazy, and then that's when she reveals herself to be the Super Scroll. So there's just there's all kinds of really neat reveals in this storyline. Things are not all very rarely what they seem. I mean, they Marvel to this day minds this material. I, I mean, ideas that were planted or ideas that we see in this uh, were used, obviously, in the Empire event. The idea of the Korean and the Skrull, you know, coming together to fight something like like that all came from from these early issues here. It's also interesting that. I think a lot of people uh, to help kind of gauge things and and, uh, moderate expectations, what people might expect when they pick up something called the Kree-Skrull War is to see an all out like galactic war. And that's not what we see on these pages. So I I just wanna make sure people are aware of that. If uh, I I don't want people to feel like we're pointing them in the wrong direction and, and that they understand that, you know, this is really focused on uh, the Avengers and sort of like vignettes on w- what's happening, but we don't get the galactic grand, uh, this idea of a Kree scroll war outside of a few panels every once in a while of, you know, ships going by and, and all that. What it comes down to is both the Kree and the scroll are deciding whether the earth based on its you know position in the galaxy is worth having as an outpost, a slave planet, or if it's just better off being obliterated. And that's what that's why the two races are fighting over it. And that's mm-hmm. yeah, so that's basically you know the 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 overall plot in a nutshell. It's what happens in between that gives the story its meat. Mm-hmm. So Joe, you made a good point that I, I do want to give credit to um to Stan Lee and Joe, uh, I'm sorry, Roy Thomas. Mm-hmm. With what they did here, if you come in here like and haven't read what's preceding, or you haven't, you're not really into Marvel continuity, they do a great job of filling in the blanks of where yeah. the parts of this story are coming from. You get a great little interlude like where it explains where Marvel came or Captain Marvel came from. You you get a you know explanation of what happened when the first time the Fantastic Four encountered the the Scree or the Scrolls. I'm sorry. And then you obviously you get the, the the cows. So every every character in there, you kind of get a good explanation of where they come from, why they're in this story, and why it's important moving forward. So they do a really good job of doing that without taking up too much real estate. Yeah, no, they 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 do a good job with that. It does move pretty quickly. 
Uh, I, I think people that aren't used to maybe reading these comics in, you know, the late Silver Age, early Bronze Age, um, they'll they'll probably critique that they're, you know, this is still a time where you could cut some of the dialogue because there are, um, now you wouldn't have every issue, like the vision and characters like that reiterating their powers and and, and stuff like that. So... I mean, what, once you're reading it and you kind of get a get used to it, uh, if you're not used to reading that kind of stuff, it, it flows pretty nicely. But I, I could see, you know, readers who, who aren't used to that uh, stumbling a bit and getting uh, frustrated by that kind of stuff. But I, I think once you're, you know, if you're not used to it after a few issues, you you adjust pretty well. I think. Yeah, definitely. Kudos to the letter because. He had to get pretty um, creative on how to how to fit some of this dialogue in those <laughs> yeah. pictures. It's like, wow, he's, you know, he's we're doing angles here mm -hmm. to, to, just to get down there. So there's there's a lot of interesting ideas here. Obviously, we end up at some point Captain Marvel, I believe, with uh, Quicksilver and um, and Scarlet Witch ends up with the the scroll. Mm -hmm. They're they're captive on a on one of their ships there, and then we've got the the Avengers down on Earth, kind of trying to figure out what's going on. And that kind of, and I believe that part is where we start getting into more of the war stuff. Yeah. Well, we also yeah. have bringing in the the Inhumans into the story, where we find out that Ronan has made a back channel deal with Maximus, for you know if if Maximus will help him, you know, um, conquer Earth, he'll help Maximus rule the yeah you know, the Inhumans, and that allows them to bring Black Bolt, who had been there was an inhuman series going on in amazing adventures at the time and roy and neil did a couple of the issues of that where black bolt had lost his his memory and was you know befriended by a young boy and that's there, there comes a point in the story where they need to go help uh, marvel pietro and wanda but they also need to go help the inhumans so they need to you know divide the team and vision refuses at first and it's up to goliath clint barton of all people to play peacemaker as they, as they start arguing with each other and saying you know, cool it guys we both we, we both want to help both and we know it and so they agree and then there's a really interesting little moment where they decide since the vision has a computerized brain that he's best suited to divide the teams to go to, you know, take care of both things and he sends captain america goliath and rick jones out to san francisco and keeps thor and iron man for himself and there's an you know internal monologue where he's going basically did i allow my feelings for marvel or for wanda to cloud my judgment is that why i kept the most powerful avengers for myself mm -hmm. so it's, it's a really interesting little character moment that you know 50 years later we know what that led to but at the time it was all new. Mm -hmm. Was it a Cree or was it a Cree or a scroll that ends up laughing when he finds out that Vision is in love with Scarlet Witch? He's like, oh, this is, I could have imagined it would be this great, you know? I think it was Ronan. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, it was Ronan the Accuser. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed that moment. Ronan the Accuser is much more um, cartoonish here in this story yeah. than, the, than the Ronan that we know today that's much more uh, serene and almost a sterile character. Yeah. Not much fun to him. Well, Ronan basically was ended up being redeemed. Hell, I think he had a he had an affair with uh, Crystal at one point. Um, it might have been during you know Annihilation in that era. Uh, I, I might have the dates wrong, but I'm, yeah. But back in those days, he was a yeah he was a mustache twirling villain, just straight up. Yeah, he's he's much uh, the characterizations is a lot different. So we're, we're kind of getting to the end of the story here. And, uh, you know, what, what did you think about the way they ended it, Eric? Were you impressed? Well, there, I thought, okay, during the story, they brought in the, the supreme intelligence of the Kree, who had been basically imprisoned by Ronan because he let his guard down. But we found we find out that he had manipulated a lot of the events. He still had enough power to do that. So he was basically channeled I, I believe he channeled the um he, he convinced rick jones that there was you know more to him than he thought which allowed and 
I think Captain Marvell um, hit him with the Om- with a version of the Omni Wave, which in Kree's hands w- is a communication device, but could do some other things. But in non Kree hands, could be a weapon of annihilation. Mm. But I think that's what allowed Rick Jones to summon forth um, the, the heroes of his youth from the comic books he'd read at the orphanage, which had been referenced in an issue. It didn't come totally out of left field. It had been referenced about six issues prior. Yeah. And it got it gave Roy a chance to play with some golden age characters because they used you know, Cap, Namor, the Human Torch, the '40s version of the Vision, the Blazing Skull, the Finn, and the Patriot, and they used them because they need numbers to to fight the 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 Kree. And then you've got you know Goliath off trying to stop the rest of the invasion, and then basically, I believe the the uh, I, I don't know if it was the Omni Wave or what it was. Basically, just shuts everything down. So, in one way, it kind of has an anticlimactic end. It's almost like someone just turned off the machine. But on the other hand, when this story was so much about you know human emotion and things like that, it, it kind of was fitting. I, I don't know how else it could have ended other than a bloodbath. But it, it this this kind of I guess the term offbeat ending may not mm. totally apply, but the but one one other thing that did happen was um, the Omni Wave was sent to Earth and exposed H. Warren Craddock as a scroll, and by that time he had whipped the crowd into an absolute frenzy of you know the only good alien is a dead alien, blah blah. Well, the mob attacks him and kills him, so mm-hmm. it, it was yeah. kind of an it, it's like a this is what happens when you incite a mob this is this is what can happen so i think that was a statement as to you know maybe that's not always the best way to handle things and i think that was the little something roy put in them that's revealed that the the real craddock had been you know hidden away by the scrolls and he's he's freed and um but yeah and it even ends on a a somewhat of a cliffhanger because Mm -hmm. they don't know where goliath is Yes. So that's it's... the that's the big mystery hanging over the end of this one. Uh, Joe, what did you think of, of Clint Barton as Goliath? I only think of Clint Barton really as Hawkeye. So I was a little bit surprised. I heard the name <laughs> Clint in the story. I'm like, mm-hmm. I have not seen Hawkeye. Why are, why are they talking about him? And then it, it, I was like, oh, he's Goliath here. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously it wasn't his most popular incarnation because everyone acts like that never happened and rarely references it, uh, you know, certainly in the modern age of comics. But but yeah, I mean, it's an it's also an interesting costume. Uh, it feels a little more almost like, I don't know, um, this is bef- I want to say, yeah, this is before Dave Cockrum and, and Carrie Bates redesigned Colossal Boy. Uh, from the legion because um colossal boy ends up having a kind of similar headgear with like the same kind of like hair uh which which makes me think they were uh you know maybe pulling a little bit from from this iteration of goliath but um but yeah i I don't know i i mean like i was getting at earlier this is a, a period of of sort of transition for marvel where they were figuring out um you know where to go and you know, from here, you know, this is, you know, still probably, I, I want to say by the time this ends, this is several months before Jerry Conway takes over Spider-Man and and um, you, you start seeing moves like that. So, you know, there's no X-Men in the picture. This is before Claremont's revitalized X-Men. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's about to happen. And, and this is an interlude in a way of that feels you know in hindsight looking back now it feels like this is bridging the gap between that like the end of the silver age and and pushing marvel into the bronze age and it's i think it's interesting looking at this story uh through that lens well it's certainly very you know it it's had an impact in the industry i mean you've got Mm -hmm. the avenger you got the new avengers team you got the old avengers team coming back in you got the fantastic four you got the inhumans you have the Cree, you have the scroll. You, there's a lot of players in this story, mm-hmm. and uh, just like the scope of it, 
you know, you're, it's on Earth, but it's a, it's cosmic, and it certainly is a precursor for a lot of what we're seeing today. I imagine that Al Ewing and um, and Dan Slott were going for that kind of feel when they did Empire. I don't think they quite hit the mark, oh, but sure. uh, you know, the, the bar was set actually pretty high on this. And this isn't the the best you know Marvel story I've ever read, but it's actually quite impressive what they were actually able to achieve in nine issues. This today you couldn't do that nowadays. Well, and again, you putting it in historical perspective, when you said that Al Ewing and Dan Slott weren't able to match that, it's because it's been done. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, yeah. you, we think about this, it's this story is 50 years old and there's nothing like it that came before. Mm -hmm. There's been plenty that have come after, but this kind of, I said, this was a template for what, you know, stories grand in scope could become. And I imagine if you were, you know, a comic book reader in, 71 and 72 you were probably blown away by it because i said it's just there was nothing really to compare it to because up to that point yes you had annual team-ups between the jla and the the justice league and the jsa but they were has the usually... fantastic four wedding happened oh yeah yeah but uh, but i'm saying that's that... the first mm -hmm. time you really got the characters together obviously they weren't fighting right. for the sure the sure world's survival exactly but, but like in those days they would bring the two teams together. It would be two issues. They'd go off, you know, two members of each team at a time and fight somebody. And they were just little, basically little vignettes. This was, like I said, th this was just so much bigger than what had come before. Yeah. The only thing really that came close were, you know, things that Stan and Jack had done in Fantastic Four and Thor. But even those didn't bring in as many players as Roy and Neil did. Yeah. And an interesting sidebar for people wondering why Neil Adams didn't do the art in 97. He'd gotten behind and the deadline was looming and Roy had no choice but to get John Buscema to come in at the last minute. Neil started turning in pages and he goes, uh, Neil, I had to move on. And that led to the fracturing of the Thomas Adams collaborative team. Well, that sucks yeah. for Roy Thomas. Is Neil. I'll tell you right now. The art is fantastic throughout this issue, but as soon as Neil Adams takes over, you're like, holy crap. Like, this, oh, yeah. This is like, <laughs> yeah. This is so clean and crisp and everything's so dynamic. And when you see Hank Pym going inside the vision and you're seeing all these weird parts, and he's trying to discover what part of his body, and there's these weird android antibodies and everything happening. It was like, this is like, it's like mind blowing. And, it, and you think about it, it's 50 years old. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, at the time, yeah, before that, the best artists on in comics were usually doing war, science fiction, and even romance comics because superhero comic fans didn't appreciate that kind of art. They kind of you know, rebelled against it at first. And so that that's this was really the first time you you got to see you know Neil Adams doing characters that at marvel that everybody knew because he was doing x-men also yeah but at the time x i mean you know x-men was being canceled while neil adams was doing the art yeah. as was green arrow and green lantern and green arrow which seems inconceivable today mm -hmm. so yeah. Eric, obviously you kind of put it in perspective from like um, a reader standpoint in the moment what it felt like when you discover these stories and and um and how it's been so influential. Joe, as, from a writer editor perspective, and just kind of going back, you, I know you read, like to read a lot of the history here. Like what, what does the Kree scroll war really mean? Like in the annals of comic book history? No, I, I mean, I, I think, I, th I think we touch on a, a lot of that, that bridging the gap between the silver age and the, yeah. the bronze age. Um, there is obviously it sets up stuff that Marvel minds for decades after this with the Kree and the Skrulls. But one interesting thing here too, is like we were talking about the rise of Neil Adams. Um, that's influential here. Um, art and superhero comics at this point, we're at a weird, this is this is such like a weird, like little like turning point or crossroads that, that comics hits. We've at this point, the best stories that John Romita Sr. was going to tell in Spider-Man have been told, but the best stories we were going to get from Gil Kane haven't been told yet. Like there's, 
it's it's interesting when you're looking at it this way. Um, you, you know, you had your uh, Gene Collins too or, or around this time, who I, I think were doing uh, good, interesting work. Um, you had uh, what was it? Continuity Studios, I, I think, was launching right around now, and uh, Dick Giorgiano was part of that. There, there's a lot of things happening here that um, everything gets set up sort of after. Uh, Roy Thomas w would go on to do, you, you know, a lot of incredible things at, at Marvel. Uh, we'd also soon get uh, Steve Englehart taking over the Avengers and creating um, within, uh, I think, about a year after this. It might have been a little longer. I'm trying to just put it in my head, but having the Avengers Defenders War, which was uh, considered the first real major crossover that Steve Englehart was able to do because he was writing both the Avengers and the Defenders. And he, I, I know this is gonna blow some people's minds, but he had to fight to get that because Marvel thought people weren't gonna buy crossovers. And, <laughs> and he had to convince them and be like, look, I can keep it consistent because I'm the one writing both. So I'm gonna know where everything is. There's not gonna be any confusion, don't worry. And, and had to convince Marvel that crossovers would sell. Uh, please don't send hate mail to time. Steve Englehart. <laughs> you, know, uh, you think about it now, dude. They don't, they don't. It doesn't matter if things make sense between the stories. It's yeah. how many crossovers can we put out? Why can't this be a crossover? Yeah, I, I mean, but um, I think Don. I think it was Don McGregor who, right around the end of this storyline, became Roy's assistant. Um, so you you had people like that. You know, Steve Gerber again was starting around then. Uh, George Perez, the following year, was Rich Buckler's assistant. So all these pieces are getting set up kind of uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the Kree Scroll War to push Marvel into, uh, you know, the Bronze Age. And um, I, I think it's really interesting looking at it from there. Obviously, all the setup with um, where the Vision and the Scarlet Witch go, um, the where they're setting up the the future of you know uh hank pym and, and the wasp you know we start seeing you know uh, hank pull away from the avengers for for good uh for good but um it, you know it, it, there's there's a lot of interesting pieces here and and this is certainly the first time that we're seeing like we were referencing before with the scrolls back in fantastic four number two um, outside of referencing the golden age of comics in terms of what Stan had set in place for him to have been involved in that. And then a decade later also be involved in, you know, closing the ties of that uh, plot line, you know, we're, we're really seeing uh, sort of the narrative power of, of Marvel at work here. The, the last thing I want to mention is how much I like the covers. These aren't the greatest covers I've ever seen, even from the sure. era. But looking at them in comparison to what we have nowadays, where it's normally, if you had a team book, it would be five characters. And one of the middles looks straight. The two on either side will look off in different directions, and that's the cover. And maybe there's a lake below them or a spaceship. But, but these, yeah. you know, it's always characters in action in an interpretation of a part of the story, normally a swerve, we would call it, what would we call it? Clickbait. Oh sure. my goodness, you know, the Fantastic Four are going to beat down the Avengers, or <laughs> the, the, the original Avengers are getting rid of the of the new Avengers, and it turns out, you know, kind of, but, you know, it was mm -hmm. playing with the audience, and it makes you want to read it. It looks exciting, and I I like having dialogue on the, on the cover to kind of explain what's happening. I think it helped. Especially 96, yeah. when, mm -hmm. when the Vision's beating the, guy, the um, Kree guy to death. Mm -hmm. But um, um, if, if they really wanted to sell these comics, though, at the time, I believe the uh, the popular thought would have had uh, a giant ape destroying a city that's on fire with all the Avengers laid out and in big letters, this issue, one of them dies. I, I think that this probably is the end. Been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they do have ominous subtitles and, and oh, yeah. uh, names for the books, but it was just so much more captivating. I'm like, man, this looks like it's going to be fun. And you can tell, mm -hmm. oh, it's a little tweak on what actually happens. It, it's screwing with you. Because, oh my goodness, who's dying? You know, kind of thing. But nowadays, everything's so 
blase. It's rare when you get just like a great cover. Well, but these, they're all so much fun and full of action. Free as a kid, you must have been like ch- champing at the bit to put your money down and buy that comp. Well, it's, I, I do want to point out that you know Joe had mentioned Hank was setting the stage for leaving forever, and he used the air quotes because forever turned out to be issue one thirty nine, where he comes back, where it, the 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 vision has. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Hank he fights the whirlwind. And his growth serum goes out of control and he just keeps growing and growing and growing. And the vision has to go inside him to save him. Perfect. Which is a nice little callback. Hopefully it's illustrated by Neil Adams. No, no, (laughs) no. no, It was uh, George Tuska and Vince Coletta, but um, it's still a good story. But, and Joe mentioned the Avengers Defenders War. And I said, I've, yeah, that is the first really truly great crossover in comics because as i referenced before between the the justice league just society team-ups that's something we we should definitely do the plot is is far more simple and it's basically a chance to let kids argue over you know who, who wins win. in a fight between the mm-hmm. hulk and thor and yeah i said it, it's you know um and if you if you read that you go one team basically kicks the other team's ass <laughs> And it's not even close, but you know, I said, but you, you, you know, I recommend anybody who hasn't read it yeah. to read it because it's a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely and, on and, the list. Yeah. As things that we're going to talk about. Yeah, it's part of comics history. I, I, I think it's important. So I enjoyed this. It, it was a fun read. I can't wait to to talk about some uh, some more older comics. I think next week we're going to try and do a DC story. Haven't figured out exactly which one it is. Uh, I had a great time. Eric, do you have any final words about this comic as we wrap this up? No, just that uh, this is something that every comic fan should read. In fact, um, I, I sent a hard copy of the Kree Scroll War to Comics Division as a thank you for giving me this microphone that I'm sure everybody else on YouTube would like to uh, kill him for. Because mm-hmm. all of this could have been avoided. <laughs> 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 Uh, so, and Joe, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Maybe we missed a moment or something more. Uh, I, I think up? we, I think we more or less cover it, but um, definitely um, go back and, and check out this time period, Marvel and, and DC. Um, look at it from these sort of perspectives. I think too often people recommend bits and, and pieces and, and you read and, and it's an isolated experience. And if you're not also checking out other comics around then, it's easy to not have the full scope. So like you should check out the Kree Scroll War and then check out what Denny and, and Neil were doing with Batman and then check out what Len and Bernie were doing with, with Swamp Thing and, and check out what Gil Kane and Roy Thomas were doing for those few issues in Spider-Man. Like try to put uh, put this in a, in a place and, and have that kind of perspective because it really gives you, I think, a better appreciation of, of comics if you're able to uh, sort of firmly place where things are and, and appreciate what's happening at the time. Absolutely. If you come in with the mindset of, of you're going to be reading something that, like a contemporary comic, you are going to be a bit dis- disappointed, disappointed. It's more verbose. You know, it, it's it's the story is much more compressed in nature. It, they cover a lot of ground, but it's a it's a lot of fun. The art's fantastic and. Really enjoyed this one. And I'll talk to you guys next week when we talk about another comic book retrospective. Not sure what it is yet. Sounds good. Sounds good. See ya.